So I'm so excited about our speaker uh, because I've known her for a very long time, but also because she's going to give us a different perspective on environmental awareness and the world in general when it comes to that sort of thing. Uh, Susan Dieterlin, now Dr. Dieterlin, and I met a very long time ago, several decades ago, when we were both undergrads at Purdue. And so when I was thinking about Acts of Green Speakers and knowing a little bit about her work and her new podcast, I thought, well, this is great. She'll be, she'll do a great job. So Susan is a researcher and designer focused on sustainability, clean energy, and how people interact with environments. She's the author of multiple books, uh, including Design by Deficit, which she's going to talk about today, the subtitle being Neglect and the Accidental City. She also wrote Immigrant Pastoral, Midwestern Landscapes and Mexican American Neighborhoods. And she has a blog called City Wild. She is the founder of Deaf Space Lab and the creator of 30% Wild, which you can see on Shirley's background, a podcast about scary animals in the backyard. Being Facebook friends with her, I've seen a lot of posts about her gorgeous backyard up in the Northeast, so it's nice to see that come to life. She's originally from Indiana and now lives in Connecticut. She has degrees from Michigan and Purdue and has been a registered landscape architect since 2001. So please join me in welcoming Susan Dearling. Well, hello everybody. I am working on sharing my screen here and I've just done it incorrectly. <laughs> Hang on just a second. There we are. Share. Okay. Everybody see the slide okay? It should be a book resting against a branch. Looks great. Thank you. Out outstanding. All right. Well, thank you so much for that nice introduction, Julie. And I'm really pleased to be here today to talk about design by deficit. So as Julie said, the subtitle to the book is Neglect and the Accidental City. And that is in fact what this is about. So your first question ought to be, what is neglect? And uh, neglect is kind of everything that we don't do. And this is the big idea of the book. It's that everything we don't do, everything that falls off the to-do list, everything especially that doesn't get funded, um, everything that we just can't pay attention to because we're paying attention to other things, really shapes the places where we live. And that's true in kind of at the scale of cities and towns, it's definitely true at the scale of neighborhoods, but it's also true at the scale of your house or your office. And my book, because I do more urban design and landscape architecture, my book focuses on cities and neighborhoods. But as I talk about this, you may kind of think about some places in your own life, um, like where everything tends to pile up at home. And if you're like me, after a while, you stop kind of seeing the places where things pile up, you know, that shelf by the door or wherever you set the mail or that kind of thing. And that is the idea of design by deficit. So in a really small way, kind of we've all experienced that. And what this does for cities is it gives us places that have a lot of crumbling infrastructure. It gives us places that have a lot of abandoned buildings. And it gives us places that have a lot of vacant lots or what I would call urban nature or accidental nature. And that's most of what I'm gonna focus on today in these few minutes, uh, because it ties in very well with your theme for Earth Month here, Earth Day. So we'll go into that. If the slide will advance, we will go into that. <laughs> One moment. Huh. Well, I was really warmed up nicely now, and now I can't get the slide to advance. Oh, there we go. All right. 
So you should, just to make sure that it's working, you now see a slide that says designed by deficit at the top of the slide, right? Okay, yeah. Yes. All right, as I, a little aside here, as I said, if you uh, joined the meeting around when I did, I was saying that I have a lot of experience presenting with PowerPoint and a lot of experience using Zoom, but using PowerPoint on Zoom, I'm a little not great with, and this is also a new computer, so bear with me, but all right, so this gives you the uh, kind of synopsis of the book here in the white boxes. And you will find, uh, actually it's not in that synopsis, that kind of big ideas in the book that it's organized around are uh, some of the big problems that are really facing our cities and facing all of us actually, whether you live in a city or out in the country or in a suburb which are um, inequality, public health, and as a little aside, I actually did the work that led to this book uh, long before the COVID epidemic. And um, so that public health is one of the organizing issues in it was just a coincidence, but it ended up being really uh, prescient uh, with the book. And uh, climate change is also one of the organizing principles. So let's see, I think I'm just going to go on and talk about urban nature here. And there we go. All right. So when we talk about urban nature and the accidental city, what we're really talking about is urban wilds. And an urban wild is a place where nature has taken over in the city, or it could be in a suburb or just in your neighborhood. An urban wild can be any scale at all. So it could be a flower bed that just kind of gets away from you. It could be a place where the sidewalk has broken up and now there are plants coming up. It could be a vacant lot. Vacant lots are kind of the, the icon, I guess, what we first think of with it. But there are a lot of places that become urban wilds that aren't um, abandoned. I guess, uh, that are owned by someone and maintained by someone, but either intentionally or unintentionally through neglect, uh, they become places where nature takes over. So this can be things like utility corridors, like power line corridors. You often see this, that uh, the uh, power company may stop mowing or maintaining those uh, partly as a financial decision, but they can become actually real assets for wildlife. You also see urban wilds along um, interstates. I don't know about the state where you're in, and it, this seems to vary state by state, but um, sometimes uh, you see that the right-of-way along interstates is no longer mowed. That can be intentional to make habitat for pollinators, but it can also be just purely financial. And actually it can be a bit of both because mowing is surprisingly expensive. Um, and sometimes you see uh, properties that are owned and maintained by um, landowners who just, you know, um, mowing is just not really a, a priority to them. And so over time, and this particular shot here, uh, it's been a long time since somebody was maintaining this one. This is from a park in upstate New York. Over time, secession will take over in a damp climate like the entire eastern half of North America. And you get these, these natural areas like this that are a mix of invasive species and native species. And in this particular uh, shot here, and I full disclosure, I am not that familiar with vegetation in the Southeast, but I think some of these plants probably will look familiar to you too, that in the foreground, you can see the uh, kind of this mix of invasives. There's a lot of um, vinca, periwinkle, myrtle in the front there. But in the background, all of those trees, there's kind of a mix there. I would bet that there are some sugar maples, which are native to upstate New York and valuable for wildlife. And that's kind of an urban wild in a microcosm that you end up getting all the plants that are real survivors, all the ones that can can get in there and kind of slug it out with everything else that uh, wants to be in there and that can survive without 
any care from us. They can thrive on neglect. You get not just plants, you also get, uh, you know, the whole suite of, of uh, ecology there. You get insects, you get birds, you get animals. And uh, that's where things start getting really interesting. You get feral species like feral cats and uh, um, feral pigs, which is on the cover of the book. And um, so that's what an urban wild is. And what I'd like to talk about a little bit today is that urban wilds actually do a lot for us. And this idea is central to design by deficit, that neglect in all of its effects, including urban nature and urban wilds, is not just bad and it's not just good. It is kind of what we make of it, which is good because we really have a lot of trouble stopping neglect. Um, because you can never manage to do everything. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what the good effects of it, what benefits we get from urban nature, um, because the bad effects are pretty easy for you to come up with, right? I mean, if you think about why vacant lots are bad, everybody can come up with a reason. So my first set of benefits here I'm gonna let you read through those. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but uh, these are ecological or climate benefits. They're kind of the same list. And the big thing is, one of you was saying something about trees uh, providing oxygen for us. That is absolutely a benefit of this. And it doesn't really matter when you're talking about uh, photosynthesis and respiration, which is what's providing oxygen and uh, improving air quality. It doesn't really matter whether someone planted that tree intentionally, and it's a tree that we look at and say, oh, isn't that beautiful? It's doing so well. Or if it's a tree that just kind of sprouted up because no one was paying attention. Um, invasive species, they produce oxygen too. They do some other things that aren't great, but they do all these things as well. So we get these benefits, whether it's nature we wanted to show up or it's just shown up. And one of the really big things when you talk about uh, climate change these days is the not just the plants themselves or the or, or the feral cats or the coyotes or whatever you have in that urban wild, but the soil. The soil we're finding out really sequesters more carbon than anything else in there. And the soil is all about us just leaving it alone and letting, you know, leaves and branches and everything just accumulate there. So that's kind of the, the top things with this. But it's not just ecological benefits. We also get a substantial amount of mental health benefits from any kind of exposure to nature, and that includes accidental nature in cities. All of these benefits are research-based. I've actually done some of this research. And these benefits tend to be a small but significant benefit. So it's ideal for something that you get every day. And an everyday way to get exposure to nature is like if you look out and you see it across the street or if you see it in your backyard, if you walk to work or you even just walk to your car and you walk through an area with vegetation or if you are driving to work although there's a caveat to that, which I'll get to in a minute, but if you're driving to work and you drive by areas that have nature in them, you get all of these benefits. You um, can definitely get them through a view through a window. So if you have a workplace where you can see out a window and see into something green, that's, that's great. You want to keep that office because you're getting all these things out of it. And um, this can tend to sound like, oh, it's, it's nice. I mean, we all like looking at flowers and trees and birds and that kind of thing, but does this really make a difference? And actually, it can make a big difference. It's kind of like taking a vitamin every day. It builds up over time. Um, so if you look at a tree once, it doesn't mean that, you know, it, it'll it cure cancer or something like that. But if you see, you get this exposure every day, it can really for example, reduce depression. There are actually a couple studies that show that regular exposure to nature like this can be more effective in reducing depression 
than taking antidepressants is. So that's pretty impressive. And actually they work best if they do them together. It's not just mental health either, though there are also some physiological health benefits. And this is a shorter list, but these are some big things that you get from exposure to everyday nature, like accidental nature in cities. Um, the I just wanna call out a couple things here that if you lower your cortisol levels, that is lowering the body's physical response to stress. And that also in turn lowers inflammation in the body. And we've been hearing a lot in recent years about how stress and inflammation are tied to basically everything. Like, I, I don't know about you, but when I go to the doctor, everything that comes up, everything I complain about, everything they warn me about, this is always a common thread, right? It being about stress and they don't say inflammation, but that's a big part of what stress does to us. So if you can lower that, you get benefits for a, just a sweeping array of uh, physical complaints. So the, um, I guess the kind of big question out of that, I'm, I'm hearing some dinging here and I'm thinking my computer didn't just do something strange. You all, you still see it, right? It's, you still hear me? Uh, okay, all right. Okay, um, that just threw me off for a minute, but. So there's a question about how we get all these benefits. How do you do this best without having other problems that are often associated with land that no one seems to be taking care of or vacant lots, which can be things like, uh, you know, worrying about property values, worrying about crime, or actually just worrying about the the possibility of crime, which is uh, fear of crime, which isn't quite the same thing as actually being in danger. So we can manage wild land in cities to be a resource more than a problem. And there are ways to do this where you can really focus on getting benefits to people who most need them. And there is research, there's something called the equigenic effect that uh, shows that people or suggests that people who have the greatest need for these kind of things, like for example, the benefits that you get in alleviating symptoms of post-traumatic stress. If you have the most need for that, you will get the most benefit from everyday exposure to nature. So it can be a really good sort of passive in a good way to make, make our cities healthier places in a really holistic way, healthier places, especially for people who most need that benefit. And um, I have totally lost track of how long I have been talking. So I don't know if I have time to go into this or not. <laughs> but uh, very quickly, very quickly, I'm almost at the end. So uh, very quickly, a couple things that are key to managing this land is that you want to be able to see it as a resource. And in order to see it as a resource, you have to be able to see it full stop because neglect and urban wilds tend to occur in places that we stop seeing, you know, places we don't notice. I bet there is a place that you pass every day on your, you know, commute to work or your way to the store or maybe, you know, going around the neighborhood or something like that. I bet there is a place you pass every day that you have not noticed that is an urban wild. And now that we've been talking about it, you may notice that, you know, in this next week. And so the first, the first key to being able to manage these is to really notice them and to kind of make an inventory of it and not immediately just think, this is terrible, we need to get rid of this, you know, um, but instead be a little more thoughtful about it. And I actually, in the book, I have a step-by-step a -step, uh, plan for how to do this, how to assess your, your urban wilds and your other neglected spaces and make them work better as an asset. A big thing in that with wild areas is what you see in the picture at the bottom there that shows the sidewalk with the with the light poles next to it. That is what's called a cue to care that um, there is research on landscape perception conducted at the University of Michigan um, that uh, 
suggested that people who are, you know, just sort of regular people, ordinary people, not people who are particularly um, knowledgeable about uh, plants or ecology or that kind of, so most people, when they see an area that looks like that, how you see it's all kind of overgrown and weedy over to the side, people tend to look at that and think, you know, oh, that's terrible. Nobody's taking care of that. Maybe this is a dangerous place. Maybe there's something wrong with that area. But if it has a mown edge like that does, and especially that's that's the sidewalk, all of that, that's quite a bit, but it really just needs the mown edge along there that people will see it as being, oh, that's intentional. Someone's taking care of that. Um, it's okay, basically. And those little um, those little signs that say wildflowers do not mow or uh, backyard habitat or pollinator garden are really like the quintessential example of a cue to care that shows people that, oh, this is, this is supposed to be like this. This is um, something that, this is a place someone values rather than being an abandoned area. So that kind of thing ends up being very important in how to manage these for benefits. And very quickly, the other picture at the bottom shows another example of how you want to manage these land, this land for maximum benefit, which is that you can see right through that woods. There's not a lot of vegetation in the, say, about three feet to about seven foot area, which uh, a study I worked on referred to as the zone of vision. So it's the area that you see through when you're standing up that um, psychologically, we generally, people are far more comfortable in environments like that where you can see into it, particularly if you're outdoors in a space that you don't have total control over what's going on in it. Um, so those are two, just two ideas that show how, this is the last point it says, the maintenance of wild areas matters for public perception. And that public perception is all about how you get those benefits that I went through earlier. Because if you feel like you need to be vigilant outdoors, you don't get all these benefits. You may get some of them, but not all of them. So it's not just if you are in danger, but if you feel like you might be in danger or even danger, you know, sounds like a lot. It could even be just that you feel like you might not be welcome in a place or like um, someone may come bother you. Um, that kind of thing, or like you need to constantly watch your step because there may be holes here or something like that. So it's danger, but it doesn't mean, I don't know, something dramatic. It can be an everyday thing. So uh, relieving that vigilance is really key to these plants. And I think that's about all the time that I have. As I said, I haven't been totally watching that, so I'm not really sure. But I want to make sure to leave some time for questions. As I think I said, and I know Julie said, Design by Deficit is my latest book. And if you're interested in learning more about it, there is a lot more in it. Um, it's a 300-some page book, so there's plenty more in it. Um, you can find out more about it at the book's website there, designedbydeficit.com. I don't think that is a live link on your screen, but uh, you can give that a shot. Um, the QR code that's over to the side of the book cover there also goes to the book's page on Amazon. So you can find out more there. And maybe importantly, you can see some previews of the inside of the book so you can read a little bit of it. And as... Uh, Julie mentioned too, thanks for that. Uh, my current project is actually a podcast about uh, scary animals in the backyard called 30% Wild. So that's my thing that I'm I'm excited about. I was working on that earlier today. And if you want to know more about that, you can learn about that at uh, 30 Wild Pod, the website at the bottom there. And that QR code actually goes to that same website. So it just makes it easier. With that, that is the end of the presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions. Wow. Um, Susan, thank you so very much. I, uh, I'd love to hear everybody's 
questions, but there's just one thought I, I really had to share, and that is with my background in floristry, I don't think I have ever felt particularly uncomfortable in the woods, even when I was not quite lost, but just taking a while to wander around. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, just wandering for a little while. But but we tend to think of natural areas as being, oh, it's a lovely, peaceful place, and you can recover, and it's good for mental health and all that. But it was a good reminder to me that it can cause more stress to some people. And so managing that that sort of interface between where they are at and the natural space with, with the um, street lights or, or whatever and creating a more approachable space is the transition space is something I had never really thought about. And I, wow, that just jumped out at me. So thank you very much for that. But yep. with that said, I think um, I would love to open up the floor for anybody who has any questions or comments. For I, I do want to say something to respond to your comment, though, that... Uh, Familiarity makes a big difference in what kind of environments we are comfortable in. This is this is research based, and that's true about wild environments. I think it's true about all kinds, actually. Um, but what I know about is out the outdoors. That uh, so, if you are someone who has a lot of um, education in an environmental topic, and forestry is absolutely that, uh, that you will, in fact, be much more comfortable in a range of, of sort of wild vegetated environments than you might think sort of everybody else's, the like regular people, the general public is, which can be really tricky if you're someone who is an expert, who has uh, education in this kind of thing and expertise in it, because that's exactly the kind of people that we hire to do plans like this. And so it's easy to think that everybody feels about it the way you feel about it, but that's really not true. Um, it, yeah, it uh, is very important to uh, talk to and get the input of the people who will actually be living near these areas. Yeah, that's a big problem with landscape architects like me, <laughs> is that we tend to be outdoors people who are very comfortable on the outside. Thank you. Okay, uh, Julia, you raised your hand. So I, um, in looking at your book um, with the, the the wild animals in your backyard, I um, just, um, I'm a veterinarian and I think, you know, when you see dead possums and dead raccoons on the road, you tend to think, well, of course they're there because they live in this environment. And yet a lot of, um, a lot of clients in, in urban areas that have pets can't really believe that these wild animals live in our, in our backyards. And, um, and I think, and they always are, are very much, oh, well, we don't have any of those, <laughs> like, and yet you see them on the road. Um, but can you speak a little bit about the, um, the wildlife that is, that is kind of adapted to living in these urban environments? And when you're, when you're thinking about creating spaces that actually encourage, you know, part, that part of the ecosystem? Yeah, um, I think that, you make a very good point. And this would probably be the first thing that I would say about that if I was talking to clients or a, you know, a municipality about this, is that those animals, I, my first, what, what I, the, uh, I guess the concern I would anticipate is that they would be thinking, well, if we have these urban wilds, now that we see them and we realize they're there, uh, this is a problem because it brings animals into the city where people don't expect to see them and you get nuisance species like possums, for example, and raccoons. And uh, so this is a problem. But I would say it is pretty difficult to exclude those kind of animals from places where people live. They are very good at living near us. And they actually like raccoons are a good example that yeah. they actually do very well near us. And yeah. there, are, there are some surprising animals that are also on that list that do very well living near us. Coyotes are one. Yeah. Um, and that, that always shocks people that here, here in Connecticut and in the Northeast, we have a lot of coyotes. Yeah. And uh, I do not live in the wilderness. I live just outside New Haven, which is a large city. And 
we have lots and lots of coyotes. They're, they like it near us. <laughs> and it always shocks people that they're around. Um, cause they're a pretty big animal and they're, you know, they're a carnivore predator. Um, but, um, there are some other animals that do very well near us that are also kind of a, I guess our perception of them is that this is a, a wild animal sort of emblematic of maybe not wilderness, but definitely places away from people. And actually they thrive where we are like white tailed deer um that really love a lot of the plants that we plant if you are a gardener you are well aware of this <laughs> um and that uh deer can actually be present in a uh, greater density like more deer per mile per square mile in kind of suburban areas than they are in more rural areas that have a lot of forest because in the suburbs we have created really really good habitat for them yeah so yeah, it's it's unintended consequences are really kind of governing things having to do with urban wildlife like that. Thank you. Lene. Thank you. Um, Susan really enjoyed the presentation quite a bit. Um, you remember you reminded me, and Lance probably remembers this too. We when we were when we first remodeled, we hired a landscape architect to come in and you know kind of tell us you know give us some ideas and everything. And he laid out a plan that included the vast part of what we consider to be our backyard, uh, which is kind of the front yard, but that's kind of hard to explain. But a big old part of it to leave it in the wild, so to speak. And he was going to actually put like little trails through it. Well, we didn't do the trails. I mean, it's not quite that big. And, uh, but we did leave it, you know, kind of wild. It's not like your pictures, but it's certainly not grassed and that kind of thing. And we do have some unintentional consequences, you know, and visitors from that. The deer love it. We had a possum visit very close to the back door, you know, last week. And the dog loved that. And, uh, but I don't know, I guess I just was, I, I'm kind of like Candace. I just never thought about, you know, what these un, what we, I don't think I'll use the word unkept anymore, but what these wild spaces meant, you know, mean to nature and they mean to us. And so but I just want to thank you. That was just a, some perspectives that I'd never crossed my mind. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks very much. It's, um, I think that, I'm not sure if this was said in this meeting or if this was something that Julie said ahead of time, that I think someone here has been doing a, a project, something about native plants and pollinators. Is that, mm -hmm. am I remembering that right? <laughs> it's part of our Acts of Green program is, is about promoting, promoting that. So many people on the screen have planted natives and pollinators as okay. a part of this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so lawn, uh, you know, mowed grass, what you think of as, as a well-kept yard is actually really not very good for wildlife. There's not a lot of wildlife, even down to the, you know, the insect level and the invertebrate level that thrives in lawn. And some of the ones that do thrive in lawn are things you don't really want around like Japanese beetles. So even if you're just kind of letting a corner of the yard go, go wild, you know, you stop mowing it, you maybe, or maybe you mow it once a year or something like that, it can make a real difference in the ecological richness of what your property kind of brings. And that can make a big difference in terms of insects, but also in terms of birds, because the birds eat the insects. Um, so if you like having songbirds around, this is in, important to them. Um, it can also be really important for butterflies. Um, it depends on what plants you have, but uh, starting with a regular mode lawn, especially if you, if you keep it up and make it look nice with things like herbicides and pesticides, um, that's really kind of an ecological zero. So anything you do that's different from that will probably have a big benefit as far as making your property welcoming for nature. Thank you. We do have a lot of birds. I, didn't, I hadn't even thought about that. Yeah. 
So Lance, I think you had your hand up. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And uh, Susan, it's a great program and it brings back, um, uh, you know, I I am one of those mowers, but I, I mow under uh, high tension lines on family property that we have. And, uh, you know, one of your comments going, you know, when you mow the grass down, really, it's not a, you know, a good thing. But I can tell you that I've been mowing before and uh, the hawks will come sit on the side. And then when a little mouse comes out, I've seen the hawk go down and get the mouse. So I'm figuring, you know, there is some positives to that because the hawk wouldn't do that if it's high grass. But um, uh, your um, program is just really interesting. And I wanted to know, can you give us an example of uh, a city or a, um, a project that you've done and, uh, and the results? Oh, okay. Um, let me think a minute. The one that comes to mind, and unfortunately, I, I can't claim credit for this. Uh, this is a big effort done by a whole team of people over a number of years. Uh, the one that comes to mind is a program called Philadelphia Green. Um, green like the color. Uh, if you want to look that up, there will be a lot about that online. That uh, over a number of years, um, I would say off the cuff, maybe 15 years, uh, it they did a big program uh, sort of, I think it was citywide, it may have been focused on certain neighborhoods of the city where they were repurposing vacant lots to serve more as basically as assets to the community. And they did some things with community gardens, but even, I'm an avid gardener, but uh, only so many people are going to be involved in community gardens. So you kind of need a plan beyond that as well. And Philadelphia Green looked at um, making vacant lots into pleasant places to sort of hang out. I mean, the way that people use parks as well as a, um, it was all kind of a temporary measure, like uh, with the idea that eventually this land would be redeveloped, but that might be a long time. Um, and the neighborhoods where these were focused are the kind of places where there are a lot of vacant lots. So they tend to be neighborhoods that have a lot of challenges that have uh, probably problems with uh, abandonment and vacancy in land and where property values are low and it's hard to get a new business going, you know, that kind of place. Um, so yeah, that's a good example if you want to look up a kind of an approach to this that was both what they did at the scale of the individual lot and what they did in sort of the impact it had on a whole area of the city. And I think citywide, you'll see as well. So that, yeah, if you want to look something up, that's that's a good place to start. Philadelphia Green, that's the name of it. Thank you. I will look that up. Thank you for that. Sure. All right. Any other questions? I do want to share that Greg and I live in what is considered next to Mount Pleasant being the fastest developing area in South Carolina, just south of Charlotte. And we live in a community of about 2,100 acres, which is rapidly becoming the wildlife sanctuary. I um, mean, to put it in perspective, we'll have a Costco in a couple of years, about five minutes from us. So that kind of gives you sort of the big picture of where we're at. But Greg has, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna poke pick on him for a second here. Greg has a camera in our backyard. So Greg, you want to share what all you've seen in our backyard in the last several years? Yeah, it's, it's kind of amazing. Uh, we have some woods between us and the next development. Also, we have a hill which is left alone that's overgrown with trees, which uh, maybe it's a quarter acre. I'm not sure. But it's amazing. Uh, I have this camera that uh, at night, usually the animals will come in. We see deer all the time, two or three deer. Even bucks come in. Uh, we've seen opossums. We've seen raccoons. We've seen a fox. We've seen um, oh coyotes. Amazing. I mean, that's kind of scary because a lot of people here have dogs. Uh, so they're very cautious about walking at night because they're all over the place. And you always see they're scattered every place, too. Uh, even in, not beyond, but again, we're you know, it's a neighborhood, and these things are just strolling through our backyard uh, all the time. And it's, uh, it's it's interesting for me. We don't have a dog, so we don't care 
but <laughs> but yeah, it's amazing the amount of activity. Uh, and I, I when I capture the especially the coyotes, I'll post it on our neighborhood website. Say, see, be careful out there. <laughs> Yeah, coyotes are really astonishingly adaptable. They are, um, among other things, just a quick, I think we're we're getting close to time, but just a quick thing about coyotes is that they are um, what kind of mid-range predators, even though they can seem very large if you're watching one walk through your backyard, um, you know, before uh, pre-settlement when uh, the eastern part of the North America had all the animals it originally had in it. Uh, there were kind of wolves were uh, top dogs, so to speak. And then coyotes were somewhere sort of below that. So coyotes evolved to have this other sort of bigger, badder predator around them. And because of that, they coyotes respond in some hey, really incredible ways to all of our efforts to get rid of them. And when I say get rid of them, I mean things like trapping, poisoning, you know, um, that one of the ways they respond is that they will have more pups under pressure like that. And they also uh, will start developing multiple den sites. So like one mother coyote will develop multiple den sites so that they can move the pups at the slightest hint of disturbance so we really are, we're kind of always fighting a losing battle against them if we're trying to get rid of them. Uh, coexistence is the way to go. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we have also, we have some really beautiful hawks. that They love to sit on the fence overlooking the, our bird feeder, uh, you know, and then we don't see birds for about three hours. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, nature of course a vacuum, and they always it always figures out a way. Uh, yeah. This hill behind us was pushed up by the developer, and ten years ago it was just rolling waves of ryegrass, and uh, now it's twenty twenty five foot tall pines that you can walk through, very similar to what you had in your photograph earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. So, the development did leave a lot of open area. There's there's some power lines that go through the middle, so that's all that's definitely open. But there's at least half a dozen or more trails throughout our development. So they left a lot of that natural area, and then we have like five or six ponds that were actually put there by the previous owner of the property who had a hunting and fishing uh, area, and he actually put the ponds in. So we still have those and some great fishing. Wow, sounds really nice. Yeah, it, it really is. We're very grateful to be here. Yeah. Uh, before we move on to the, the next thing, I just I want to say just how grateful I am that to our guests, uh, Dee and Zuby and Rebecca and Marge, thank you so much for being with us today. It's great to see you, really. Um, I was asking Dee in the chat, um, I, I assume, I, I'm not a big West Coast person, but I'm going to take a wild guess and say that's the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> is that true? Can you, is there a reason you selected that one for your background, or is that just uh, just for fun? Oh, that's so funny. I'm definitely not there. It was the closest thing I could find to water. I'm actually in a really small area close to McCormick. I'm in Greenwood, South Carolina, and we have a lot of lakes. Lake Greenwood is our lake, and and so it was. I I love the water here. Uh, my husband and I used to be avid fishermen and boaters and things of that sort. So no, nowhere near there. <laughs> yeah, okay. right. Well, thank you for sharing that. One thing, Susan, that we do like to do is uh, honor our guests each week, our, our speakers, with um, a book that is specifically um, uh, selected for you. Now, this one was easy. <laughs> we selected your book. Um, and this goes into a little free library somewhere here in the upstate of South Carolina. So thank you very much for that. Well, that's um, fantastic. That's I, I love that idea. Well, it just, you know, instead of mailing you a, a cup or a mug or a pen or something like that, you know, this is our way of saying thank you. Oh. And uh, so that's, I think we're right at one o'clock and we do like to try to stay on time. And uh, for 
everybody. Uh, if you're new to Rotary, you'll um, what we do at the end of each meeting is share the four-way test of what makes us Rotarians. So if you would unmute, we do share this together. Please say with me the four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. First, is it the is truth? It the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? concerned? And third, will it build, 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 build better friendships? And, friendships? and fourth, will it be will beneficial, be beneficial to all concerned? concerned? I hope everybody will tune in next week. We have another guest of Julie Tobies, who is Bethany Hacker, and she's with the New Foundations Home for Children. So please do join us next week and uh, go out and have a wonderful afternoon on this absolutely gorgeous day. <laughs> Great to see everybody. Absolutely. Thank you.